All right, so welcome everybody to Eager at Office Hours. My name is Carolyn Knight with the Santa Clara Valley Audubon Society, and I am really excited to be able to do uh, this quasi Eager at Office Hours with you guys. Uh, so normally we do Eager at Office Hours on location in the middle of the rookery uh, with the birds all around us. Um, we've got a full setup with scopes and binoculars and volunteers, and you can kind of think of us as the friendly um, evangelists who will just come up to you and talk to you about birds rather than trying to get you to hang out with us on the weekends or get you to sign a petition. Um, this usually works pretty well. Um, I don't know if it's just because we're very excited about the birds or because the birds are making a ton of noise, um, or if it's because I lead in with the we have stickers, um, but it works. Uh, we have a good time with it. Uh, and a lot of people get to learn about the egrets because of it. Uh, we're not doing that this year. Um, and it seems pretty unlikely that we'll be able to do that this year in person. Um, but I'm still really excited to be able to share the rookery with you guys um, and to be able to show you some of the really cool things that goes on there. Um, now, What's really cool about the rookery itself is usually when we see egrets and herons out in the wild, whether we're visiting the bay or we see one along a creek or a river or at a reservoir, what we see is this really controlled animal. They're hunting their prey. They're standing completely motionless, waiting for a fish to swim by. Everything about them is under control. Um, we get to see this really graceful bird just flying very slowly throughout the sky. Um, and I think that's amazing. They're absolutely beautiful birds. Um, but that's not all an egret is. And the rookery gives us a chance to see the part of their lives that isn't nearly as controlled. Uh, it's not nearly as graceful. Um, and we get to see them being kind of ridiculous, uh, which is a joy. Um, birds are absolutely gorgeous. They're really cool, um, but they're ridiculous and they experience growing pains and they can be clumsy, just like everything else. And I think that's one of the really important things to making birds actually relatable to people, something that they can connect with. So tonight we're going to be exploring the eager rookery of Shorebird Way. Um, and it was called that before it was a rookery. Um, you can question the literacy of the birds, but either way, it's a great name for the location. So as we go into the rookery, um, I just wanna orient you guys in case you have never been, um, or just need a reminder. So the Shorebird Egret Rookery is located on Shorebird Way in Mountain View. It is in the middle of the Google um, <laughs> campus. Uh, so there's a little bit of walking. Um, the nearest uh, really accessible uh, public parking, unless you're parking in the Google lots, is going to be on Crittenden. Uh, but it's a great part of a walk if you're going along Stevens Creek or if you're visiting Shoreline. Um, it's a great hour-long stop if you want to take some pictures or if you just want to be absolutely surrounded by birds. Um, walking to the rookery is a really fantastic nature walk, despite the fact that you're going through a tech campus. Um, there's a ton of native plants, which actually helps support the other wildlife that's found moving through the rookery. So not just the egrets, um, but it's part of what's responsible for the butterflies. Uh, so you'll usually see monarchs, you'll see swallowtails um, like this guy here, flitting around. Um, there's a ton of bees visiting the poppies, and occasionally you'll see the lizards, although they tend to stay away from the rookery because they are fair game to the egrets, um, and no bird is going to turn down an easy meal. But once you get to the rookery, you kind of hit this wall of sound. And what's neat about egrets is they don't have the complex vocal cords that our songbirds have. So when we listen to them, you're hearing this 
huffing, almost barking sound. The snowy egrets um, sound like they're gargling. And all of this together is kind of doesn't really match up with the appearance of an egret or a heron, which is this really graceful, pretty bird that makes absolutely ridiculous noises. So what is a rookery? So a rookery is just a communal nesting ground in this case for egrets and rooks, uh, sorry, egrets and herons. The term was uh, actually coined from the nesting habits of rooks themselves, um, but we use it for really any communal nesting bird. There's safety in numbers. Uh, the nesting habits of a bird tend to be pretty secretive. Um, and part of that has to do with their life cycle. Birds come out of eggs. And so there's a two week to almost a month long period of every bird's life where they can't move and they are basically nature's best meal ever. It's high in fat, it's high in protein, um, and it's stuck in one place. So bird nests either have to be really well hidden, they have to be almost inaccessible, or they have to be defended by the parents. And so the benefits of a rookery is that there's always gonna be somebody around keeping an eye out for predators. Um, and on top of that, the egrets and the herons on the rookery at Shorebird Way um, are nesting pretty high up in sycamores. They're a good 20 feet up in the air, uh, which protects them very effectively from any ground-based threats. And when you're looking at numbers around anywhere from 40 nests to over 100 nests, that means there's always going to be at least one or two fully grown adult egrets or herons that are keeping an eye out for anything from a crow or even a hawk that might come by and see about snagging an easy meal. Now, these are the nests we're talking about. Um, they're, they're bunches of sticks, for one. Um, egrets aren't super great when it comes to nest construction. Um, we actually see this quite a bit when we have years where there's heavy windstorms during the nesting season. Uh, sometimes the nests just fall apart. Um, so they're constantly adding more sticks to them. Um, they're constantly looking for more sticks to add, which gives us a really great behavior to look for. But inside of these nests are these really great blue eggs. Um, they're about the size of a chicken egg, um, but they're all this lovely, almost robin's egg blue. And you can find the shells all over in the grass, in the gutters, in the middle of the street. Um, so it's a nice thing to keep an eye out for um, as the nesting season moves on. And I mentioned the sticks. So one of our favorite things to do in the egress office hours is to just watch the egrets look for sticks. It's mostly the males that are doing this behavior. The females are the ones that will add the sticks to the nest. And you can always tell when he's brought back a disappointing stick because she just chucks it. Um, so we do advise visitors to the rookery to keep an eye out from above. Um, you never know if you're going to be right next to a falling stick or part of an egret baby's lunch that was brought back and it didn't quite uh, measure up or, you know, anything else that may come from birds. Now, when we're moving through the rookery itself, it's a good idea to know when it's most active. Um, there's about a three month period where the activity is really high. So while we do see egrets and herons starting to arrive in April, um, your best bet for finding activity is between May and July. There's always a couple of stragglers that are hanging on in August, um, but to be honest, there's not a ton of them. And at that point, um, the rookery smells like it's been hosting a bunch of fish eating birds for several months. Um, so I don't recommend visiting in August. Cut off your visits around July. You'll still see babies. You'll still hear a lot of activity. It doesn't smell as bad. Um, <laughs> it's not a consideration we usually talk about, but it's, it's worth mentioning if you're planning a trip out in there. Now, 
The egret rookery has been monitored for great egrets in two, starting in 2005. So that gives them 16 years of residency. Uh, in 2008, we saw the snowy egrets arrive. And then in 2017, we got black crowned night herons, um, which was really exciting. And we've been watching how they interact and sort of move closer and further away from the rest of the egrets. Um, in 2019, uh, we saw the black crowned night herons kind of take over their own little corner of one of the Google parking lots. Um, and the entire uh, collection of parking stalls underneath those trees was completely whitewashed. Um, so they, they do put out signs of, of warnings if you're going to park near the rookery. Um, don't leave your convertibles top down. Now, the birds ain't themselves. Obviously, we have to start out with the egrets. Uh, so this is our snowy egret. We can identify these guys by their bright yellow feet, um, which they'll use as they walk through the shallows of the waters to stir up uh, fish and bug life and sediment. And then they've got a black bill which sets them apart. And here's a closer view of this guy. You can see their plumes, um, which these guys grow during the breeding season. Um, these plumes were actually really, really desired um, by milliners, hat makers um, in the early 19th century. Um, and to the point where these guys were actually almost hunted to extinction in part because they grow them in the breeding season. And they're communal nesters, which means you only have to send one hunting party out to get a whole collection of feathers for your most fashionable hats. Um, unfortunately, that has a really uh, fast effect on the population numbers of the birds when you're culling them right when they're reproducing. And the snowy egrets, as they're breeding and trying to attract a mate, um, you'll notice that the skin between their eyes and their beaks turns bright red. Now, this doesn't last very long. Um, once they've laid eggs and they're feeding young, you'll notice that that skin turns back to the bright yellow that we usually see the rest of the year. Um, but there's that short window where they've got some really fantastic coloration going on. The great egret. Obviously, it's going to be quite a bit bigger. Um, this guy stands at around three feet. It's got a five foot wingspan, um, but they've got black feet and they've got a yellow bill, which is a little bit more helpful than just the sizes. Um, if you're considering the differences between snowy egrets and great egrets, because sometimes comparing those sizes is a little bit tricky. And compared to the snowy egrets, red coloration on their face, the great egrets go with green. Um, so that's another difference to keep an eye out for, but just like the snowy egrets, it doesn't last for very long. So I wouldn't rely on it as a field marker um, for any length of time. And like the snowy egrets, they grow these fantastic plumes, um, totally useless for flight, great for attracting another egret. And we've got to mention our night herons. So the black crowned night herons um, are a largely nocturnal bird. You'll see them a lot in the Charleston Slough area next to Shoreline Lake. Um, they like to hide in the reeds. And during the daytime, they're, they're pretty still. They're, they don't want to be up. They don't want to be awake. Um, but if you go on nighttime walks, either in the slough area or if you've got a neighborhood park, odds are pretty good. You guys are going to see these birds poking around either on the edges of the water or even in the middle of a park's field, uh, digging up bugs and worms. And they've got these fantastic red eyes. Now, this year, we've actually got white-tailed kites nesting right next to the rookery. Um, they've got a very loud baby right now. Um, these are really striking raptors. They're white, they've got bright red eyes. And frankly, they're absolutely gorgeous. We see them hovering over the marshes um, in the kiting behavior um, that was named after the birds. Um, and these are also a bird that's been renamed 
more times than I want to count. Um, so if you call it something different, that's totally fair. <laughs> it's probably going to change within five years again anyway. <laughs> The black Phoebe is one of our favorites. Um, when we're burning in the county, uh, there's, there's a small running joke that you haven't really been burning unless you've been able to add a black Phoebe to your list. Um, that holds true for the rookery. Uh, these little guys are fly catchers. So they're predators of their own right. Um, they really love to find a perch um, in which they're gonna keep an eye out for any flying insects and they'll swoop down to grab it. Um, and on top of that, they actually nest right next to the rookery. Um, you can see their nests, which are little mud shelves clinging uh, to the sides of the buildings, usually right next to the windows. Um, so we always get to keep an eye out for these little guys. And then we've also got bluebirds. Um, so we've got mature trees in this area, which is always great habitat, particularly if there are woodpeckers in the area for our bluebirds because they're cavity nesters. Um, but we also have a couple of active nest boxes that the bluebirds make use of right next to the rookery. Uh, so you can get more nesting birds than just the egrets and the herons with a visit there. And these little guys are, of course, absolutely adorable with some great colors on them. And walking through the pathways, you're also probably gonna scare up some dark-eyed juncos. Uh, these little sparrows are really tiny. They like to stick close to the ground, but as they're flying away, you'll see flashes of black and white that are really great at catching the eye, even if you didn't quite see them when they were just rummaging around in the leaf litter. Now, I want to show you guys some babies. <laughs> now, that's kind of the reason we go to the rookery. Um, baby birds are delightfully awkward dinosaur muppets. Uh, they make weird noises. They are insufficiently covered in feathers. So you get these weird skin gaps. They just look super scruffy and they are completely ill-proportioned. Uh, so these are great egret chicks. Look at those faces. They, are, they have googly eyes. It's ridiculous. Their entire face is beak. Um, doesn't get better with a different angle. Um, but this is kind of the, the opportunity to really see birds as the dinosaurs. Um, they, they show it best when they're babies. The black crowned night herons. Now these are older chicks. Um, I can assure you they look just as scruffy uh, when they're about a week younger than this. Uh, but it's interesting because the black crowned night heron, rather than being that really crisp, black and white and gray that we saw with the adult, they're striped, uh, which means they've got some great camouflage when it comes time to move away from the nest and start hanging out in the reeds and the trees during the daytime. They blend in really, really well. And of course, they also get to be awkward. And the snowy egrets. Um, we actually see snowy egrets coming out of the egg with dark bills as well as yellow bills. Uh, they can be born out of the same nest, um, which does get a little bit confusing when we're looking at the great egret chicks, which also have yellow bills. Um, but you can see that these beaks are a little bit finer. Um, they don't quite encompass the entire face of the bird um, the way that the great egrets beak does. And when they're stretching like this, you really get a chance to see the wing structure uh, before all of the coverts, um, those small feathers that basically smooth down the line of the wing grow in. Um, in this one, you can actually see how the feathers are actually growing directly out of the arm of the bird, uh, which is pretty cool. So what are these birds eating? Pretty much anything. Um, they are predators. And with feeding time with the rookery, it tends to get a little aggressive. Um, everybody has knives attached to their faces, um, which really kind of begs the question as to how nobody loses an eye. Um, but the parents seem to be pretty under control with this whole situation. Um, when we're getting 
a look at it when it's slowed down, it doesn't really get less alarming. There's there's less jerking and squabbling in the background, but um, as you can see, everybody's really up close and personal and the babies are always hungry. Now, both parents are gonna be involved in feeding these babies, which is good um, because there can be anywhere from three to five chicks in the nest of a snowy egret. That's a lot of mouths to feed, especially when you're considering they have to hunt for their food. Um, these birds are going after fish. They're going after frogs. We've seen evidence of crayfish being brought back to the nest for the babies to eat. We get to see lizards being eaten. Um, and you've probably actually seen um, an egret or a heron in the grass hunting for rodents, um, which are also fair game for the babies as well. Uh, we had one year where we got to watch a bullfrog be fed to a baby, and it spent a good five minutes trying to swallow the thing, um, and then it promptly took a nap. So we continued to watch the nest to make sure that the baby came up for air afterwards. Um, and you get to see the chicks squabbling amongst each other after feeding. Now these little guys are absolutely awkward. This is a really cool time in a bird's life where you can actually see the feather tracks. So normally we get these adult birds and they're all sleek and clean. And you think, oh, they're, every inch of them is covered with feathers. It's actually in stripes um, down their bodies. So while the feathers themselves overlap really nice and neat, um, not every inch of their skin is covered in those feathers. And we get to see an example of some of the food that they're bringing back. So some very large fish, even some lizards, although you're not gonna see great blue herons at this rookery. At least you need to go a little bit further afield for these guys. So what is being done to protect this rookery? Because it is a really important place. We get a ton of egrets nesting here. Um, back in 2018, it was home to about 20% of the South Bay's population of egrets coming in to nest to raise their young. So one of these things is habitat management. Um, this is in the middle of a tech campus. And obviously there are certain standards of, of care that are to be expected. But during the nesting season, um, there is no mowing that's allowed underneath these trees. Uh, so you tend to see a gigantic amount of growth from the grass and the plants all around. Uh, this means that there's a ton of space for these birds to hide in if they're able to. Didn't work out so well for this great egret chick. Um, but it also means that it's a nice soft landing. We do see baby egrets fall from the nest. Um, and once they've left the nest, whether it was intentional or not, the parents don't feed them anymore. They consider their hands washed of the whole thing. Um, so that soft landing doesn't do these birds any harm. And the lack of activity underneath those trees means that they're experiencing less disturbance and less stress as both the parents are trying to feed their young and as the young are actually growing. We also get road closures. Uh, so this is a baby snowy egret on top of one of the road closure signs uh, that the city of Mountain View puts out. Um, this is really important. It means we don't have to worry about any of these babies on the ground being struck by cars. It means that there's once again, less activity going underneath the rookery. And it also means that birders and people who wanna go visit the rookery can stand in the middle of the street without worrying about being hit by a car. Um, you still get the cyclists coming through, um, but they tend to give better warning when they're coming up behind you. And of course, we've got the plants. Um, so there's been a ton of work with native plantings in the area surrounding the rookery. Um, that means that not only is there a ton of insect life for our other wildlife to feed on, um, but it also just kind of adds to the rookery itself. It's a really gorgeous place to go and visit. You're seeing a ton of flowers, 
you're getting butterflies, as I mentioned, you're getting other birds that are visiting to hunt those bugs that are brought in by the native flowers. Um, and it just makes for a really fantastic uh, place to visit, not just for the birds themselves, but to just spend some time in and enjoy. Now, I wanna thank Google um, for sponsoring Eager Office Hours. Um, we literally couldn't do it without them. Um, and all of the contributors of the photos and videos uh, that we got to see in this kind of virtual tour of the rookery itself. At this point, if you've got questions, um, either in the chat or if you would like to voice them, um, I'd love it if you guys could unmute with your questions. Um, so Carol uh, had a question about, is there parking nearby? Uh, the nearest public parking that I'm aware of is on Crittenden. Um, that's a little bit of a walk. Um, there are handicapped stalls that are nearby within the Google lots. Um, we can't quite give tacit approval, um, but I can say that they're there. <laughs> All right. Dwight. Hey, Carly, can you talk a little bit about the, the, the Charleston Marsh that's right nearby, uh, about going, you know, I, I oftentimes walk by there and, and is that public also, or what, what, what's the story on that? Yeah, so that was originally um, part of an overflow area, uh, to my knowledge, but there has been a ton of planting of native riparian trees to the point where it's its own enclosed habitat. Um, it's still within the Google property, but it's a really cool place to look for um, our migrating warblers and the like. Um, so it's a really great spot to stop in at if you're visiting the rookery as well. Um, so Annette has a question of what do you when do you know if a baby or youngster in the crowd needs rescuing or is someone monitoring? Um, so Google actually has instructions on this, uh, the sign that basically states the location of the rookery. Um, the Google employees uh, have direct instructions as to how to report um, an injured um, juvenile egret or heron um, that's in need of rescuing. Um, and in that case, uh, the bird is uh, tr transported to wildlife rescue centers like the Wildlife uh, Center of Silicon Valley for rehabilitation um, and then release. Um, uh, uh, Shani, let me know the retention basin, Dwight, is open to the public. Um, so there shouldn't be any access issues with that. Um, and that's that marsh area. Jan. Yeah, tell me again where the retention uh, pond is. I'm not sure. Yeah, so it's just north of our, um, it's just north of the rookery itself. Let me pull up the map. And I can show you on it. So it's that little blue dot right above Charleston Road um, in line oh, with the okay. Eager Rookery. I can see where you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. I, have, I also have another question. Certainly. Um, I have a handicap, you know, sticker thing for my car, so I go there. However, I have been approached by a security guard there, and he said I should not park there. I said, even if I have a handicap, and he said no. And so I'm kind of concerned to park there, even though, you know, according to what you say, it's kind of okay. But I do park on Space Park Way and I do come through, there's a little fence opening and I do yeah. that. Is that what I we have to continue to do? Because it makes it really different. It does. Most, most uh, rookeries and things like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so unfortunately, um, all of the, the lots directly surrounding the rookery are all privately owned um, oh. by Google. Um, and so they, they do have the right to 
Buddha. I discourage uh, yeah. <laughs> public parking. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Space Park is another really good option. It is closer uh, than the Crittenden. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I yeah. landed on that and that seems to work, but sometimes, you know, it's just a little longer way in than when you're, yeah. when you're actually near Shorebird. Yeah. And and it is it is a little extra confusing because the road itself is is public property. Um, yeah. It's just surrounded. Um, I noticed they have bike lanes, so that means you can't park there. Yeah. So yeah. it's kind of come and see us, but don't come and see us. Or we've got this really wonderful thing. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes. I know we talked on the phone once, and you said you folks were working on it, but I know it's a kind of a delicate issue, but it's. It's, it's such a wonderful thing to see the birds. I do what I have to do to do it, so. Yeah, uh, yeah, it is, it is a great experience to be able to see them. It is, <laughs> yes. Carolyn, we can bring it up. We can Sorry, bring it up again with the uh, city and see if they'll allow a little bit of uh, street parking in that end of Charleston. I asked him once before, we should do it again. Yeah, that uh, does, that, that sounds like a, a great, great thing to do and, and please let me know if you need um, voices to that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good. Yeah, Dwight. Yeah, I uh, went over there a, a couple Fridays ago and it seemed like uh, there's a, a lot more uh, leaves on the trees or something. It's, mm -hmm. It didn't seem a lot less open than it, it has in the past. Mm -hmm. Is there just, is it just the time of the year maybe or? Or uh, is uh, the just uh, seems like there's more branches and it was hard to see the nests. Yeah, uh, we did see fewer nests this year than we have in the past, so that may be contributing to it as well. Um, we're not sure where the other birds are, um, but they do occasionally change rookery locations um, oh, based okay. on based on whatever cues they're reading. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I parked over there and uh, I saw a, a couple security guards came by and they just said hi. Yeah. Do oh, really? So it depends oh. who, you, who you get. And I think maybe two, uh, maybe weekdays might be better. Uh, you know, I went on a weekday late afternoon too. So uh, it depends. And there was, part, there was nobody parked there hardly at all. It was oh. all empty. So, yeah, so it, it, it does vary in terms of what the response is um, oh, for, see. yeah, when you, when you go, it's, uh, you, you're going to have more people around with you when you're going on the weekdays. Um, there's still not a ton of traffic. Uh, so uh, Jan asked, uh, do I think the rookery started up in 2005 or was it just there before and not monitored? Um, it's odds are odds are pretty equal for either one. Honestly, um, the birds were likely present beforehand, um, but the monitoring is when we've got hard numbers um, for the birds actually being present. Um, it's, it's just as likely that they were in fact there and it may have just been, it was small enough numbers that nobody would really noticed. Um, although that's kind of hard to believe considering how loud. <laughs> how loud they are yes um and there's there's something very special about watching a great egret try and navigate tree branches um they're not they don't do well with it um <laughs> Carolyn? yes uh, can i add something so from what i understand the rookery has been there for a little over 20 years uh not forever 20 years, a little more. But initially it was only great egrets. Um, then the snowy egrets joined and only about four years ago, the uh, black crowned night heron showed up. Uh -huh. So it wasn't always exactly the way we see it now. Yeah, so we, we have been able to watch some, some pretty distinctive changes uh, in the makeup of the rookery itself, which is pretty cool. Um, especially when you consider the, the opportunity to see uh, the patterns in nesting behavior. The snowies tend to arrive a little bit earlier before the, the great egrets do. And then uh, the great egrets like to nest 
further into the, the center of the tree, whereas the snowies will go all the way out to the ends of the branches where you're, you're starting to think, I'm not sure if that's really a secure place to oh. build your nest, sir, but um, <laughs> you do you. Um, so Lori, Lori asked, how long do the parents sit on the eggs? Um, three to four weeks is how long they're going to be incubating those eggs. Um, and it takes the chick about the same length of time in order to fledge and leave the nest properly, assuming they don't have an early exit of the nest, uh, which does happen because they like to clamber around the branches and they're, they're delightfully awkward um, and they're very clumsy. <laughs> Yeah. So sometimes they fall. Um, so any nest is going to take two and a half to three months um, before it's complete. And then as soon as those babies are out of the nest, uh, the parents are off to do their own business. Um, oh, really? They're monogamous through the breeding season and then they go their separate ways. Um, oh. Because once again, these are predators. They have to worry about feeding themselves. And that's not super conducive to hanging around other egrets. Although, of course, if you've been to Charleston Slough, you've probably seen night herons in the dozens. Um, so it doesn't always hold strictly true. Um, the rookery is honestly my favorite in terms of actually getting to see the behaviors of these birds because you do get to watch a ton of drama um, going down, whether it's over over the sticks, um, which is its own little soap opera of, of finding the perfect stick on the ground um, and maybe having to fight somebody for that stick. Um, maybe the perfect stick is still attached to the tree, <laughs> which doesn't work super great. Um, these birds are fairly large, um, but they don't weigh very much. So their efforts to pull the sticks from the trees doesn't usually work very well. Um, and then there's always that that split second of decision when they present the stick back to their their mate, and then she throws it off the side. Um, it's 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 disappointing, and he just he just goes back to find another stick. Um, so we we do get to watch this this lovely little soap opera going on of of, of attracting a mate, and then you know being able to keep her approval and then you get to a point where they've got babies and that adds a whole other aspect to it as they're trying to feed the babies and the babies themselves are squabbling and, and scrambling around. Um, and at the same time, while we're seeing all of these things, we're also seeing only a fraction of it because we're looking at them and they are 20 feet up in the air from us. Um, so there, you, you get a chance to see the whole lifespan as they grow, grow from incredibly just scrappy little things um, into these these beautiful birds, um, and they leave, um, and you'll you'll see them, you know, on whatever body of water because they're they're literally everywhere in the county, um, and you can. We, we don't ban the birds. So there's, there's no way to, to really be sure that, oh, that's, that's one of the babies I saw. Um, but it's, it's always a nice thought of, well, maybe I saw you when you were a chick. Um, so Ronald was asking, where do the great blue herons nest? Um, I know of a rookery in San Francisco. I know of a rookery in Half Moon Bay. Um, Gary, is there any chance you know of a local or a closer? Yeah, there's several nesting sites for great blue herons. There's uh, one at Levin Park uh, that's active every year. Also in uh, Amadan Lake, the island there. Um, there used to be a, a nest site in Vasona Lake, but I don't think it's been active recently. Um, I think the Vasona one may have been taken over by egrets. Uh, yeah, so those are the ones that I can think of right now. Yeah, so bodies of water um, are very, very popular. Um, and that's, that's one of the things that plays into the location of the shorebird rookery as well, because while there's not a giant lake right next to it or surrounding it, they are right next to Stevens Creek. 
Um, they are right next to the San Francisco Bay. Um, so they are, there's a ton of hunting grounds for these birds, which is really important in terms of having to feed, you know, anywhere from three to five yeah. hungry, hungry babies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, so uh, Jen's mentioning uh, the Grant Ranch had a great blue heron colony um, that was abandoned because of bald eagle interactions. Um, and that's uh, one of the interesting things as we're seeing bald eagles kind of come back into the county, um, how they're disrupting uh, some of our, what we consider normal um, nesting behaviors of our more residential birds. Um, so it was really cool to see the bald eagles in, but they're still, they're very large predators. Um, so seeing how that disrupts the behaviors of our other wildlife um, is always really interesting. All right, do we have any other questions about our egrets or the rookery itself? Or we'll, even... Uh, we'll... I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Will we'll, uh, a, 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 an egret uh, defend against pr a predator, uh, defend another nest, not its own, uh, from predators? So they, they don't like any predators getting the area. too close in the area itself. Okay. Um, we, we get to see a ton of protesting happening whenever the crows get a little bit too brave, oh, uh -huh. um, which is, is a joy because crows are notorious uh, for stealing into the nests of other birds, um, which is always fun. It's it's nice to see someone other than a crow put up a ruckus. Um, and, and with the egrets, it is a complete cacophony. Um, so we, we do get that as, as one of the defenses of the rookery um, nesting strategy is there, there's a widening of what you consider to be your space. Um, so Jan is asking, has the number of nests of the snowy egrets been fairly constant over the last few years or have there been population swings? Um, we have actually been seeing a, a slight increase um, over the years while the great egrets have been decreasing a bit in number. And obviously there's been a spike of the, the night herons as well. So it's a slow increase for the snowy egrets, um, but it's, it's, it's been fairly, fairly steady um, in terms of that. It hasn't been um, a large um, spike as the years go through. Um, and then Ronald's asking, are feral cats or red foxes a threat to the nesting birds? They're more of a threat. Go ahead, Shani. Um, we haven't seen feral cats there in a long time, um, but I think that there was a red fox last year because we, we found some traces and almost no uh, babies under the trees. So might have been eating the, the, the chicks that fell off the trees. Yeah, the, the nests themselves are, are pretty secure against the foxes and the cats because they're so high up. But um, there is that, that period of time where they've, they've left the nest and they can't quite fly yet. Um, and we'll see them climbing the shorter trees and bushes uh, during that period of time. Um, but that, that is a point in their lives where they're, they're very vulnerable to predation from something like a fox or a cat, which is it's going to go after prey that maybe looks a little oversized. But then when you consider oh. the coordination of a juvenile animal, um, because they're, they're just as clumsy as <laughs> children can be, um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's less of a, of a strain on the predator's part. Um, to capture them. Do, do flying predators ever attack the rookery or the nests in there? Or? So uh, we, we do see, uh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, what happens if they do? Yeah, so it, it really does depend on what part of the nesting season we're in. Um, at the height of the nesting season, we don't see a ton 
of that threatening behavior simply because of how many um, nesting birds there are. Um, but at the very start, we do we do get to see um, some incursions by it's it's a lot of a lot by the crows, um, but you'll occasionally see a hawk fly by, and all of the birds go on alert at that point. Um, about five years ago, there was a red-shouldered hawk that nested with the egrets on a tree just feet away from, like in the middle of all of them. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> yeah. And, and the egrets aren't, don't seem to be bothered by the kite nest at all. And that's, that's I mean, maybe 100 feet away from the rookery, if that. Um, so it, it really does depend um and on how threatening they think the bird is um with with something like a red-shouldered hawk or a kite um I, the the size discrepancy um in terms of of the raptor versus the eager to the heron um kind of kind of makes them a null threat um but if if it's if it's something that likes to raid nests um for eggs or or the very freshly hatched um chicks um that's that's when we get to see um some some very defensive parents mm -hmm. yeah so do we have any other questions that are, are are burning about the egrets or or the rookery itself or the other birds that can be spotted there yeah jan yeah, one thing is, um, is there any way if I tell friends about this thing that we've watched wonderful show tonight with you that we can send to our friends? Yeah, so um, I've been recording this. This is going to be posted on our YouTube channel. Oh, um, good. So it will be searchable um, oh, sure. for that. Yeah. Welcome to Santa and um, I'll actually put the link to our channel in oh, oh, great. Thank the you. chat for everybody. So uh, Ronald is asking, is the mercury contamination a fit problem for our fish eating birds? Um, very likely. Um, we do get to see bioaccumulation of heavy metal toxins like mercury um, in, <laughs> in a lot of our ecosystem here, um, pretty much all of the fish are contaminated. And of course, as you go up the food chain, uh, that contamination, um, gets to higher levels. Um, I don't know if there's been any studies on the birds themselves as to what effects that's having on them. Uh, but for birds like our egrets and our herons that are almost constantly feeding on prey that's going to be found in those waters um, is very likely that they have at least uh, noticeable levels of mercury within their systems. Um, so that's a really excellent question um, and something that that is is it would definitely be something I'd like to see answered. Um, in terms of, of research. All right. So with that, if there aren't any other questions, I'm going to release you guys to the rest of your evening. I want to thank you all for coming out tonight or tuning in rather. Um, it was really nice to see you guys um, and to be thank able to, to be excited about the egrets. Um, I would, I would love to do this in person with you guys, um, but unfortunately, it doesn't seem like that's uh, it's going to pan out. Um, that being said, uh, please tune into our website. We've got some really exciting speakers coming up for the month of July and August, um, <laughs> including a researcher on female bird song. Um, the, the author of Bird and Moon and uh, even a researcher on corvids. So if you've got crow questions, um, July 7th is, is the day to tune in to our speaker series. Um, and you can also find our updates on what we're doing in person on our website as well. So that is scbas 
www.ncpsa.org um, if you're unfamiliar with it. So thank you all for coming out and have a great evening. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful talk.